Are you ready? The Cornelia Stephanie Show, Wake Up to Love, Your Call to Action. Join Cornelia as she empowers others to live heaven on earth. Cornelia teaches listeners how to be the authority over yourself, embracing your inner guru. Feel yourself uplifted into limitless expansion, integrating ease and grace in a changing world. This show will cover topics such as unconditional love, your physical body, how to be in extraordinary relationships, create financial and emotional wealth, embracing entrepreneurship in the new earth. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Cornelia Stephanie Show. I'm with Dennis Gaither. Hi, Dennis. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. So, Dennis, we are, again, talking about Hakomi today, and I just want to tell the listeners a little bit about, if they're tuning in today for the first time, Hakomi is a way of being with another that is, in essence, mindfulness-based assisted self-study. It's experiential, focused on the present, and makes use of reactions evoked by little experiments with a person in a mindful state as a way of discovering how we organize our experience and to release limiting beliefs about ourselves. Underlining and supporting this process is the practice of loving presence created by focusing on those qualities of the other that inspire and nourishes us. And I love this learning about Hakomi and the loving presence and the words that are used and the exper experiential practices that are used so that we can um, be, be present with each other and also nourish each other. Cool, thank you. It's, it's been a, a delight to share this with you, Cornelia. You have such enthusiasm uh, for it. <laughs> And that always warms my heart and, and giving me an opportunity to share it and get the word out with other people as well. Yeah. And, you know, people, um, if, 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 if uh, the listeners didn't see our last video, you can, you can find it on my YouTube channel, Cornelia Stephanie um, YouTube. And you can look at the little experiment that Dennis and I did last show. And you'll see it in the subject line. It says Hakomi because people really enjoyed watching that and listening to and, and watching us interact and, and giving a demonstration. But I'm sure we're going to do a little bit of that again. Maybe we'll do some, some of that again today. We'll have fun. We'll have fun. So give us a recap, you know, uh, what is a, an experience like? What is a Hokomi session like? Okay. Happy to do that. So, so, well, well, first of all, loving presence is really the grounding and what loving presence is, is, you know, if I'm, I'm being with you in, in completely present, but specifically attuned into something that uh, about you, the other person that inspires, that nourishes me, and that becomes the groundwork from which everything else follows. Uh, so so that's, the, that's the grounding. But the other things that are really important elements, one is a really, uh, really close moment to moment attunement. There's connection, there's attunement uh, that is happening instantly uh, in the moment that creates a sense of safety. And it actually is a healing experience because most of us <laughs> haven't had as much of that as we perhaps needed as we were growing up. And, and it actually has, over time, it can have actually positive effects uh, in just in terms of how our brains are wired. Uh, you know, we can develop a more secure kind of attachment. But there's some, some other things that are really unique um, as well. Uh, and one is that what we're really attuning with, focusing with, uh, is, the, is the person telling the story. We call this the storyteller. Mm -hmm. In any conversation, uh, there's a person having something to say. Like right now in this instant, I'm tell saying something and you're listening. And other times it's the other way. But, but there's, all, there's a storyteller, me in this moment, and a listener. Uh, you in this moment. And, and most of the time in most conversations where the conscious attention and awareness goes is on the story. It's the third entity and there is the story itself. And it's not that that's a bad thing, but when all of our conscious awareness is on that, um, then we miss 
another part of the, the communication because there's a direct communication between the storyteller and the listener. And that's instant. The story itself is always going to be about the past. Even if it's from something that happened 30 seconds ago, it's still about the past. Or even if I'm talking about some anticipated future, that's still constructed from past experiences. But what's happening directly right now is instantaneous. And it's communicated non-verbally. And most of the time that happens outside of conscious awareness. But practice that we have in a Comey is actually to really pay attention to that and make it more conscious. And it begins with, I, as the, as the person's listening, really tuning in and paying attention to the storyteller. But in doing that, we, we start to paying attention to ourselves as we're speaking. There was something that Ron Kurtz, I, there, I, have, to, I, I have to really honor Ron Kurtz, who was my teacher uh, and and there was something he said, this is one of my thousand favorite things that he said, it's in that list somewhere, there were so many. But one of them he said is that what the adaptive unconscious needs, in other words, what we need for that part of us that organizes our experience to feel safe, what it needs to feel safe, two things. It needs to feel loved, loving presence, and it also needs to feel gotten. I'm not likely to unburden myself or show my tender side if I don't feel like the other person cares about me, but also I have to feel like they get me. That's so huge. Yeah. And, and so, so besides the tracking and the loving presence, we have ways of communicating yeah. that, we're, that, we're, that we're tracking, that we're following. Yeah. Um, this, this is something that, that is my personal belief system too, that all beings really want to get gotten. I, I, I say Absolutely, that we want to get gotten. All beings want to get gotten. And I also, um, I, I love the, um, the piece about love and mm -hmm. offering, offering our, our loving presence, our consciousness to the present moment, it, it, whatever it is. And that's where... Yeah. Yeah can really happen right right yeah yeah i'll just mention just real briefly a couple of ways we communicate that we're yeah. following and one of those we call acknowledgements and those are just little short statements kind of woven into natural pauses in the conversation that just kind of communicate i get it like i can see how excited you are about this i can see how interested you are i can see how sad you are right now I can see how hard this is for you to talk about. These are just little statements that are communicating. I'm kind of tracking where you are, you being hypothetical, others. Yeah. And, um, and they're focused on the storyteller, not the story so much. They're not comments on the story, but it's about the storyteller. Those aren't too far out of normal conversation. Uh, but the other that we use are contact statements. And contact statements are just little one or two word statements that are just woven into the conversation. Um, and just kind of name some little sadness, huh? Some excitement there, some relief, huh? And those those are a little bit more subtle, but also very powerful because as as the, they tend the, the session tends to deepen as the person feels gotten. And in our level two trainings, we spend a lot of time practicing the art of contact statements because they're not really questions. Questions tend to pull us into our head to of the answer and they're not definitive statements either because it's more like offerings it's like an offering no that's not it okay let it go so those are those are some of the ingredients that kind of go into and into uh, the work that we do yeah i i love these um this this form of communication uh, actually you know a lot of the the work that i do you know with with clients i didn't know was called Hakomi, but <laughs> having presence to, to another human being yeah. they are, you know, revealing their past or they're healing from something in their past, right? Is, is really, um, is, is Hakomi. Well, yeah, it is. We can, or, or Hakomi is that, whatever way you want to put it. But yeah, yeah. you're a natural loving presence. I've, I've known that about you for a while in our conversations and even doing this right now. So, uh, yeah. And you know what I love, what else I love about it, Dennis, is like a lot of times it's really practicing the art of listening, mm -hmm. practicing mm -hmm. the art of listening and listening is communication, right? Is yes. Listening is communication. So because a lot of times 
what people do because they're preoccupied with so many things. Um, they're not really listening to That's right. the person because they're thinking in their mind how they're going to respond or how they're going to reply to what is being said. Right. Right. Instead of really like completely bringing a hundred percent presence into this communication, being a hundred percent present, yeah. not, not thinking at all about how I'm going to reply or what I'm going to say about it, but just being fully here. That's so important. That's so important, Cornelia. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and this is how we're, this is how we're nourishing each other. And mm -hmm. this is how we're, you know, offering healing. Even if you're doing this practice on your own, like, you know, being, being with yourself, this is a wonderful practice is to listen to yourself through your journal and having compassion and having, um, being, being a witness to yourself, to whatever is up for you in the present moment and mm -hmm. listening. Yep, it does. One of the one of the joys of doing this work is actually you do learn to be a, a loving presence with yourself, and uh, you know, and sometimes, sometimes that's difficult, and then it's useful to have another person being in loving presence with us. So, so it, it they're both uh, both the willingness to receive that, but also to provide it myself. Yeah, you know, I really believe that um, you know, there's there's a lot of work we can do on our own. Really, you mm -hmm. know journaling and um you know healing and and doing doing this kind of work and then there is other work that where we really need the witnessing the absolutely we do. someone else right so that, um it, was, it, it, it just it just depends and it's really all okay um, totally. it's totally all okay to um to have a witness and to have a, a, a person a facilitator a coach or a counselor someone that is holding that loving um, presence for you while you are unveiling yourself, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, certainly I think all of us, certainly my own experiences, I'm willing to go a lot deeper uh, with a witness and it tends to stick better. I can have thoughts going through my mind pretty quickly, but if there's a witness, it tends to nail it down. I find that for myself and, and for others as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because the healing is not just taking place, you know, for the person that is sharing, it's taking also place for the, the person that is witnessing. So there, there's, there's so much, so much happening. So it's, it's amazing what, um, what is being healed with our love. And our love. Yeah. There, there's a healer inside of us that if we can get ourselves out of the way, it can carry, it carries things that it can, you know, certainly if we're being a healing presence to assist someone, uh, certainly that can guide our intuition and in how best to be helpful. Um, but it also tends to guide whatever needs to come up and, um, and have, its, have its life in that moment. Yeah, and I this is one part that, that I really love. I'm so glad we're talking about Hakomi now and, and really bringing this energy out so that many people that are just now, um, you know, maybe they're hearing this for the first time, but that they can possibly, you know, um, discover this is exactly what they needed to hear. Mm -hmm. And um, that, you know, maybe H Hakomi uh, practice is something that they want to learn further about. So we're going to take a break on the Cornelia Stephanie show. We'll be right back with Dennis Gaither and Hakomi. Thank you. Hi, my name is Janet Hickox, and I want to tell you a little story about a story and how my friend Cornelia Stephanie helped me through to the other end of that story. I have gone from the dark of a story I was telling myself that wasn't true to the light of optimism to see my way out of where I was and to where I want to go. And it all started with uh, her scheduling a session for me to help me reclaim my money or my financial empowerment. Up until that point, I had been telling the story that my business was dying, that my business was not successful anymore. And the more I tried to figure out what was going on, the worse I felt about it. And when I had to get ready to do the session with Cornelia, she asked me to go look at the numbers and where I was uh, through the year to date. And then also to come prepared with a number that I wanted to uh, raise my income to. Well, I was quite comfortable with that part, right? I knew where I wanted to be. 
Uh, what I wasn't comfortable with doing is going and looking up those numbers, but I made myself do it. Even though I tried to backpedal my way out of the session, um, she didn't know that, but I was going to try to get myself out of the session. And I looked up those numbers and it was incredible that I discovered through that process that my business wasn't dying. In fact, I was doing 12% better than I had the year before. So I was shocked. I was shocked literally at the power of the story that I had been telling for months. But more than that, I was shocked that I had allowed myself to get there. And uh, later in that day when I had my session with Cornelia, she pointed out some very obvious things like, how are you going to get where you want to go if you don't know where you want to go? How are you going to get there if you don't have the goals written out, if you don't have it uh, set up so that you know where you are and where you're going to go? Totally makes sense, right? If I, and I had been in business, uh, somebody else's business as a sales manager for years, and I, I was a national sales manager. <laughs> I had awards for sales management. I had business awards because of numbers. And yet when it came to doing my own business, I totally forgot all that I'd ever learned. So by the time Cornelia working with me in just one session got me to look deeper at the numbers and where did I want to go and actually, you know, claiming where I wanted to go. Um, I was filled with a sense of optimism and hope like you can't believe. It was like everything shifted for me. And I am so looking forward to our continued sessions to see how far I can really push myself to get where, I, where I've only dreamed of being, where I've never taken the dream and actually brought it into concrete existence. So thank you, Cornelia, for the work that you're doing out there. I appreciate it, and I can't wait to see where I go from here. We are back living heaven on earth with Dennis Gaither on the Cornelia Stephanie show. We're talking about Hakomi. And now we want to find out how does a, how does a session unfold? Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. And so, in, I mean, basically it just starts with settling in and I just listen in loving presence. And the other, per I'm gonna use you to, for the other person, not necessarily specifically you, but just the other person. So then you can just begin talking about whatever you want to talk about. And, and I'm just attending to not only what you're saying, but I'm just noticing whatever little nuances, gestures, ways of speaking, little bits of emotion or feelings that might be there. Um, I might offer those little acknowledgements or contact statements that we talked about a few minutes ago once in a while. Um, and I'm starting to just sort of get maybe little intuitions about maybe experiments that we might do or what might be if there's a challenge that, that the person is dealing with that maybe there's not only the situation right now, but maybe there's a backstory that's being brought into the situation that is, uh, that's, that's feeding into it and creating some of the unnecessary suffering associated with it, which is really what we're about here is relieving the un unnecessary suffering. Um, and, and then there, there may be some times when I might invite you, the other person to do an experiment. So one of the things when I start to get some idea or little intuitions, or we call them hypotheses, um, a couple of things we don't do. Uh, we don't like to get into intellectual analysis. Mm -hmm. Don't like to get into uh, making interpretations because you know I don't know what it might be. It might be quite surprising. We do experiments and these are experiments in mindfulness. And let's just pretend for a moment that I suggest that might, we might want to do an experiment. And, and how we might do that is I just invite you just to become really mindful and just noticing thoughts, feelings, memories, images that might be coming up as they occur in the present. And uh, there may be other times where I might notice gestures that we call, or ways of speaking, we call those indicators. Um, and the experiment, it, is always intended, something that's always intended to be nourishing or to uh, uh, invite a sense of curiosity. We don't do trial runs of something that we know is gonna be oppressive or unpleasant. Uh, it's always something that's potentially nourishing. 
Mm. And then, and then, and then we're just, then we just notice what comes up in response. What comes up in response to doing the experiment? Yeah. So, so that's kind of a little bit of a background. So, I think we talked about maybe doing something here. So, let's let's just talk about out of the, the vast range of experiments, um, we can talk about uh, maybe a specific kind of experiment that we would do. And so, one of the things that we're looking for is there's something that the person's wanting to experience that they're not able to because of how they've learned to organize their experience around old core beliefs, core experiences that they're, that they're not able to, uh, to, to, to organize. That they're not able to allow themselves to have or have fully. And so the way we might study that is, is to invite them just to get, first of all, what I always, Ask, you know, it's always with permission. The principle of nonviolence. You know, uh, if they already know what an experiment is, it's like, yeah, we could do a little experiment about that. And they're usually quite eager if they've had some experience. And if they don't yet, then there's a little more background in about what mindfulness is. But I might invite a person just to get really mindful and and offer the experience as a verbal as a verbal offering. It's so it's it's symbolically offering the experience, and then we pay attention to what comes up. Uh, and typically it's three kinds of things. One is nothing comes up. Hmm, nothing happened. Okay, well, it just means my hypothesis was wrong. We just let that go. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it will go in and the person takes it in as nourishment. And it's like, okay, that's good. Uh, what felt good about that? The third possibility is if it's something that I think they, that they might have had trouble taking in, like maybe a sense of safety or being welcome. And there might be something that comes up in reaction to that. And, and we work with that uh, in a little different way, but maybe we could play with this idea of doing an experiment first here. We could do, you could do yeah. it we could do kind of an experiment like that one. Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. So so I we can do a little kind of a fairly generic sort of verbal offering here. And uh, and then, so I'm just gonna uh, just invite you just to, just to become really mindful. Just that just means noticing thoughts, feelings, body, just kind of being open to whatever comes up. Um, and, and with a kind of a sense of curiosity, I wonder what'll come up here. And, uh, and, and it's okay if it's nothing, if it's okay if it's something, it's all fine. It can be either eyes open or eyes closed, whichever it is, uh, feels more comfortable. And so just maybe just take a few breaths and kind of settle in a little bit and just really getting connected with your inner life a little bit. And when you're ready, you can just give me a nod. Okay, so just notice what happens when you hear me say, Cornelia, it's okay to feel fully seen. It's okay to feel fully seen. What comes up? What came up is, oh, great. Okay, so 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 we could kind of we would say that that's that's that went in. That went in. That went in. That went in. I really touched you in a really kind of a deep, tender way, huh? It did. It was. It it is. It is an affirmation of truth. Yeah. It's an affirmation of divine truth. Yeah. And and what what makes me um, so joyous about that is that it wasn't always like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a little celebration going on here too. There's a celebration going on. Is that my automatic response from the subconscious now is responding by going, great, it's yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You know, so there might have been a time in the past when something came up that said, "Wait a minute. Oh, don't know that." But let's if something like that did come up for someone, not for you here in this example, uh, I wouldn't try to, to talk. You don't try to talk the person out of it. It's kind of like this is an important part of how we organize our experience here how the person organizes their experience. 
And <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what a mind that actually touched me at one point was was uh, uh, early in my Hakomi life here was was the one that's called You're Welcome Here. Okay. When I first heard that, there was a mixture of profound, well, it was like, forget the, forget the Kleenex, where's the mop bucket kind of thing. But there was a little part of me that's more skeptical. I don't know about that. And so those kind of things. Uh, so what we would do then is we invite, with the person's permission, if it would be okay to have someone else take that inner voice over, the one that says no or in some way. And this the example of you're welcome here, that little voice that says no way. And so it's kind of like, it's honoring the, the protective system there, but it's also like the person doesn't have to do it themselves. Yeah. And so what often happens is you get down to the next layer. You get to the next layer and, you know, and so in, in my case, when I was the, 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 the person experiencing this, uh, I, I fairly quickly got back to being four years old and getting not being able to not not being allowed on to play on the baseball team for the obvious reason that I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> and and uh, when they put me on second base, I was staring at the ground, looking at bugs and things. Uh, but my little four-year-old brain kind of created a belief around not being welcome. And and that's what we do is as uh, as little children we make create a belief about ourselves um, that that really doesn't really apply anymore. It might have been a distorted interpretation back then too. Um, and, and and by simply just honoring the, the protective system that we have, uh, letting somebody take it over, we get to, we might go through several layers, but we'll often get to some kind of core experience like that one. Um, and um, and then and then it's it's sort of like there's a there's a corrective kind of experience we can have of just letting this little four year old in this case feel welcomed. There's different ways of creating this in experience. And um, but also looking at the belief, does that really apply anymore? What did this little dentist decide when he was four years old? Um, so uh, so. You know, basically, that's that's kind of like a, a little bit of how we do experiments. Yeah. And uh, that, there are other kinds of experiments too. Uh, uh, we do a, a, a full year training. We go. There's there's a lot of different kind of experiments we can do, but that's that's a really basic one. But they're they're always done in a very respectful kind of way, um, and uh, and and it's done with genuine curiosity. It's not with an agenda to prove a point. It's to uh, help a person in their exploration of how they organize their experience. Beautiful. How, how, that's what we do. So it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. If you would have asked me last week at this time, Friday, I um, I was getting ready to go do a Facebook live, and I the topic that morning was how to love yourself through anything, and I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to come on because at that time I felt really. It withdrawn and inward mm -hmm. and I didn't want to be seen yeah. I didn't want to come out and so wherever wherever that was up for me last week I did not I did not want to come out I didn't want to be seen and I um I spoke about it openly that I don't want to be here I don't want to talk about and, this. And you really let yourself be seen in that, that part. I, said, you know, I really don't want to be here and this is really uncomfortable for me and I'm loving myself right now. I'm totally loving myself yeah. through this and I'm being vulnerable. So, right, is because we really have to, we have to be vulnerable and letting go of all of those places within ourselves that we weren't seen before, where mm -hmm. we weren't honored yeah. and, and allowing that to happen now, right? Right, or often we have a shyness about see, being seen because we weren't being seen in a very kind way or at least we didn't experience ourselves being seen, it might've been a more of a scrutinizing or judgmental or critical way. And so we have protectors that kind of say, I don't want to be seen that way. So I'm not, I'm not going to let myself be seen. Um, and so, so that idea of not letting oneself be seen is kind of, it's, it's protecting something very tender inside of us. Yeah. You know, what, what, um, what has been a big limiting belief for me over the years 
Mm -hmm. I'm taking up too much space. Uh -huh. I'm taking up too much space. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, because again, the belief that I should be, um, you know, I should hurry up and, and say what it is that I need to say. That this is how I was trained, right? So children should be, um, uh, um, I shouldn't take up that much space. Right. That was, that was the belief. So yeah. having over, you know, overcome that, that um, it's okay to take up this space. It's, right. Right. Let's, let's do it. Well, let's just maybe make that as a hypothetical here. So, because it's a really common one. I, I don't Is it? deserve the space I take up here. Okay. Even if I may have another one that says I take up too much. But, but so the experience that, because I, I have a part like that too, the experience that I wouldn't let myself be having is just to feel like I, there's plenty of space for me. So, so if you were my Hakomi therapist, you could offer that in the same way we just did. Dennis, there's plenty of space for you and see what comes up. And, you know, it might go in and feel really good, maybe nothing, or maybe there'll be something that will come up. No, there's not, or some little voice and we can take that over and maybe we can kind of come down to some, often what will lead to is some early life experiences in which kind of a sense of, uh, there's not enough space for me. Maybe I'm not important enough. Um, can can kind of come up. Uh, we haven't said much about what we do with that, right. with that when it does come up, because uh, it's not just about getting there. Uh, but we're 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 actually working when we're working with a memory. We kind of said Hakomi is a present moment kind of practice, and yet here is a memory of something that happened long ago. Uh, and and what we're working with is not the past. We're working with a memory that we're ha that someone is having now. It's memory as present moment experience, even though the subject matter may be about the past. It's not treated as some literal, not necessarily literally exactly like that, because human memory actually is is very malleable. But what we're actually really after. Um, are what, what the patterns and the beliefs that got set in place there that are still acting. And uh, there's a couple of parts to that. There are many parts to it, actually. The two main ones, there's an emotional part. Um, and that really depends a lot on what's happening right now as the person's experiencing memory. Maybe in the earlier time, they had to deal with a situation alone, but now there's, there's somebody with them. Um, and so there's kind of like a corrective emotional experience that's there. Yeah. And when we take that kind of memory back in, it gets reconsolidated along with what happened just now so that it kind of gets reworked emotionally a little bit. Yeah. So there, but there's also a, a, a cognitive part of what's the belief that got laid down back there that now I'm operating under. And, it, and it's not likely that a three or a four or a five-year-old consciously sat down and decided, I'm not welcome here, or I'm not lovable, or I'm not safe anywhere. Right. It's not likely that they would have done that, but they would have just set a pattern of responding to the world that would be as if that belief was true. And so part of just kind of putting words to it, oh, that's what that four-year-old decided back then. Okay. Um, not that he consciously did, but but it's kind of as if that belief came into being then. And it's at that level, we can start to change our mind. Uh, and it's in a combination of working with that, that kind of child state of consciousness. You can tell the adult dentist, if we, if we haven't worked on that early experience as many times as you want to, you're welcome here, but there's still a four-year-old that doesn't believe it. But if the four-year-old's consciousness is here, um, then we can actually, uh, 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 do some healing, do some change. Uh, and that's where the, the transformation comes in. It's both uh, what was the meaning the child gave to it, but there's also something about, is there something in the experience that was lacking then that could be maybe provided even in a symbolic way now. And in Hakomi sessions, we do that in some very creative ways. We might get several people up to the, and, 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 and play a game and invite the person to join uh, or or people can stand guard and provide a sense of safety, uh, or 
you know, there's so many, it's very creative. It's actually kind of fun to do that. So, so there's both an experiential. So it's not just, just a mind thing or a cognitive thing. There's, there's an emotional experiential part, or maybe it's just being held by a comforting presence for as long as you want to be held. Um, or, you know, there's, there's, there's many variations on that. Uh, so both those parts are important. And, and I, and I think it's important to include both. And I, I, I think not all modalities necessarily include both. Um, uh, some can be a little bit too cognitively oriented and some maybe can be the emotional expressive parts important, but so is the going for meaning part. Yeah, you know, what, what really um, is brilliant is the experience of changing the belief, the negative limiting belief of there's not enough space here for you. That was um, the subconscious belief that that the being, the person has acted out upon their life. They, they felt that, that belief was true. And now through Hokomi, what's happening is a new belief is, so the old one is being taken out and a new belief is being installed through a new experience by you saying, yes, Cornelia, there's plenty of space here for you. Yeah. And we're actually having this, we're actually having this play out. And now that is the new belief. Well, actually, let me, let me explain that just a little bit more. Yeah. But if I were using that example, if I, yeah. when I use the statement, uh, there's plenty of space here for you. I'm actually not trying to put that in as a new belief. I'm offering that as a possibility and seeing what comes up. Okay. Uh, Ron Kurtz used to call those probes. We call them offerings in the Seattle Hakomi to see what comes up and what ex as the as the person kind of gets in touch with what the what the core beliefs might be um they tend to come up with their own reworking there we kind of support them in that okay that's great and uh so that uh so that you know and it might be exactly that but now i can take in that idea there's plenty of space for me but it's not that i'm trying to reprogram them with a new belief Okay, that's really a good distinction because what you're doing, it's an offering for something else to approve yeah. an offering and they get to decide what their new belief is going to be based on whatever is coming up for them. Yeah, as, as we release something that's been there, then we could kind of decide what, what would be the new thing that we would like to take in. Yeah. And it might be very much related to that original offering. And sometimes we'll kind of redo the offering and see how it goes in now. But it's not with the an agenda that would you know if I really had this idea I got this idea what the beliefs you should have and try to uh, and try to manipulate them into accepting it we would consider that uh, an act of violence in this work. Wow, that's powerful. And, and nonviolence is one of our principles. Yeah, and you know what I mean. And the belief the belief that um, there's space here for you isn't isn't a bad belief to have. <laughs> oh my, my goodness, no, it's not. Or feeling yeah. welcome or feeling yeah. like it's okay to be fully seen. Yeah. Those are all good things. But still, yet again, you guys, like you said, you have a, a protocol and you have uh, principles that you're following and that, that the intention has to be clear that it's not going in to reprogram anyone that <laughs> they need to decide for themselves. No, it's assisted self-study. Uh, and, but what, what makes it work is, is that, the, that everyone has inside themselves, uh, there's something, we call it the uh, organicity principle in Hakomi. It's, it's there's a healer, I tend to personify it. There's a healer inside everybody. Yeah. You can take that as literal or just as a metaphor, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the, there is something that knows what it, what it, there's something that calls us to be, be more whole and to be more healed. And this work is really about not deciding where that should go, but uh, uh, aligning with it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Do you have any other um, experience, experiences for us or a little um, something that we can practice before we take our next break? Oh, let's see how much time. We have just a minute or two. I, well, I'll give you. We have, we have a little while. Okay, cool. Well, I, I, uh, I can tell you an experience of my own here. And okay. this was in early days of working with Hakomi. In fact, it was still in a training. It was in Mexico with Ron Kurtz when he was still living. And I was working with someone. And, um, and there was an awareness that there was something that was kind of tight in the back of my shoulder. 
And there, there are a couple different ways we could have approached that. One would be what we call attention sequence. But the way we did in this particular time was a little different than that, was had someone take over the tension. So uh, in the way that's done, I'm laying on the floor. And if I were to exaggerate that movement, it would seem to want to pull my arm back. And, and I might have wondered if maybe there's, I'm wanting to, I, I wondered if, I, maybe I want to punch, you know, but, but I couldn't, I wasn't aware of any feeling like that. So, uh, so, but the way we did this was by an experiment in which I'm laying on my back and there's a person working with me and, and I would just move my arm forward and she would push against it. So basically she was taking over the holding back. She's doing it for me. And, and so then just simply allowing the movement really, but it's done really slowly. It's not about overpowering. It's about just being really slow and just noticing what comes up. And in this case, the movement wanted to complete itself. And, and what the movement that wanted to complete itself wasn't that, it wasn't anything aggressive. It was actually an extending a hand out, a reaching out movement. You, you know, on the, on the audio, you can't see this, but it was extending the hand out with the palm up. Uh, and so what was being held back was uh, a desire to reach out. Wow, that's what was being held back. That was what was being held back. And then that, there are you know, experiences from early life about, uh, about why that would be something fearful to do. But, uh, but I don't know any way of getting to that except by, or maybe you could have, but uh, really working through our somatic experience uh, to borrow a phrase from Freud, it's really like, it's the early, it's the uh, Royal Road to the Unconscious. He, he applied that to dreams, but, uh, but we apply it, often it can be uh, to our somatic experience because it's a, the body is an intra-personal communication device. Mm -hmm. Our patterns and our core beliefs uh, are often expressed there. And by working through that expression in certain ways with mindfulness, uh, we can actually get to um, those kind of beliefs, uh, basic core beliefs. And, and I mean, I've had people go all the way back to birth experiences uh, with doing those kind of things. Um, uh, so, uh, so it can be, uh, it's, it's actually really powerful and ever fascinating um, and uh, delightful. I love it. I love, I love talking about it. I love the, uh, just the energy around it, you know, um, mm -hmm. the, the loving kindness, the nonviolent communication, the um, the healing that takes place, the uh -huh. empowering, the empowering uh, experiences, and to you know, again, that that creative part where there's you know, just between the two of us or between a group, and all the healing and everything that that can take place. I just so glad that you brought Hakomi to us here on the Airwaves Transformation Talk Radio and getting um, getting this information out for people that that really are ready to receive this level of healing in their life, right? Yes. Cool. Yes. Yeah, it's wonderful, Dennis. So let's take a break on the Cornelia Stephanie Show. We'll be right back with Dennis Gaither. My name is Bob Skeel. I'm 91 years old and I want to take a few minutes now to share with you the important role, actually the critical role, Cornelia has played in my life. I say critical because I'm not sure I'd be alive at all to the many possibilities that make up our human experience at my age, if not for her. I could have easily become another dead man walking, only half conscious, stumbling through my remaining years, if it hadn't been for Cornelia. Six years ago, I lost my wife to Alzheimer's We've been married for 61 years. I never thought I'd be a widower, but there I was, suddenly lost and alone, but with the good sense to set a working goal for myself. I was going to spend the rest of my life committed to unconditional love, whatever that meant and wherever that took me. A year or so later, Cornelia came along, helping me over several years to focus that unconditional love where it had never been focused before, on me. My whole life, my entire being had been focused on love of neighbor, and I had derived great satisfaction from that. But in the process, I had ignored the second part. 
I love your neighbor as yourself. Now it was time to direct that love inward. I didn't see that right away, but Cornelia did. And she drew me there. She drew me actually to God. Through many conversations over coffee and after numerous, sometimes tearful, agonizing discussions, Cornelia was able to lead me kicking and screaming to within where I needed to be. It was there finally that I was able to re-identify myself. It was in bringing unconditional love to myself that I now saw myself in a new light, a fully conscious, worthy human being capable of healing, loving, and creating in my own right all these gifts of the evolutionary process. I'm a new man now, younger as I get older. I don't move as fast as I once did, of course, but my smile is quicker and I engage the heart and mind of others more readily. I would likely not be at such a wonderful stage in my life if not for Kania. I owe my new life to her, a wonderful friend and a constant source of inspiration. Thank you, Cornelia. We are back and you're listening to the Cornelia Stephanie show. We had such a great show. I, I feel, you know, Dennis and I were talking about it during the break, how nourishing we both feel and the vibration and the energy that, that we've created with um, this discussion today. We, we really hope that you're feeling this, the love and feeling the nourishment of, of uh, this information that we shared. So Dennis, we want to let the audience know about upcoming Hakomi events and, um, you know, insights on where, where people can, you know, find out more about Hakomi. Cool. I'd be happy to do that. So in the Seattle area, I'm part of a, of a group we've been working together for, um, for about 20 years now. Wow. With, when we first trained with Ron Kurtz, and then uh, after a three-year training, then we created the Seattle Hakomi Educational Network. Uh, www.seattlehakomi.com. So we, and, and we've really uh, created a sense of purpose together of fostering loving and healing community. And that's really been an underlying theme as we uh, share Hakomi. Uh, at this point, we have workshops that go all the way from introductory workshops to professional level trainings. And I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about some of these specific ones. So there's one coming up very soon on the Bastyr campus called Deepening Skills. That's on March 2nd and 3rd. And there may be a couple of spaces still available. Uh, that one tends to fill up pretty fast. You can inquire about that on our website. Deepening Skills, we actually do Hakomi sessions. These are coached one-on-one -on -one, uh, with one of the uh, 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 trainers. Um, there are four senior trainers and um, and then uh, for also uh, uh, tr uh, trainers as well. There, everybody is uh, very experienced. There's, I think I once added it up, and between all of us, there's about a hundred years of cumulative uh, experience doing this work. Wow, what wisdom! Yep. And so, uh, I think the, well, the next uh, local event is called Nourishing Communication. It's in Seattle, uh, March 9th and 10th, and. Uh, and then we have several of our, our teachers and trainers doing that one. The next one that I'm actually involved with is called Loving Presence. And we'll be doing that one in Bellingham. My uh, dear friend and teaching partner, Lynn Morrison, and I uh, do these workshops. We've been doing them together for a long time. We have a lot of fun. And Loving Presence, well, we talked about that practice. We actually give it enough importance that we actually do a whole two-day weekend workshop. For people that are psychotherapists, social workers, massage practitioners, these are all accredited for CEUs. Um, and I would be willing to bet this will be one of the most enjoyable CEUs you've ever gotten. There are no PowerPoints, it's just experiential. We laugh a lot, we play a lot, and we learn a lot. So uh, I'm, it's just really is delightful uh, to share that. Um, one of the things that gives me uh, a great deal of joy is just to witness someone's blossoming. Um, and I, I feel like I get opportunities to do that really often. And uh, a large part of that is because of this work. So I'm very grateful to Ron Kurtz and to uh, Donna Martin also, who was uh, 
a close associate of Ron's and um, and was also really a major uh, Hakomi teacher and my friends at the Seattle Hakomi Educational Network. So love to have you check us out and maybe we'll cross paths in Hakomi land sometime. That's wonderful. Dennis, can you give us that, that name of that website one more time? Sure, it's just www.seattlehakomi, H-A-K-O-M-I.com. If you Google Seattle Hakomi, you'll find us. We'll be right there at the top of your, of your, your page then. Great, yeah. You guys have quite a few uh, events coming up, two in early March and then one in April. So it's a wonderful way to get, like you said, get started or, um, you know, get a taste of Hokomi. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to let everybody know that uh, if, they, if they like this kind of information, I share a lot of my uh, co-host's information on my newsletter, on my weekly newsletter. And the way that you can get the newsletter, this is so cool, Dennis, text the number 228, text the word Cornelia to the number 22828. That's it. Text the word Cornelia to the number 22828 and you get, you get my newsletter. Or you can do it uh, traditionally and you can go to my website at corneliastephanie.com and you can sign up for the newsletter there. And also while you're there, you might want to take advantage of my Keeper of the Garden course. It's a 21-day audio e-course that assists any person to move into a greater sense of peace, to release and let go of anything that's no longer serving you for 21 days, and it's less than 10 minutes a day. It really helps you in rewriting the story of your life and also letting go of what's no longer serving and grounding in a greater sense of harmony, a greater sense of peace, a greater sense of I am worthy, I am love, I am abundant. It's a, it's a beautiful course and the people that have um, experienced it are now going through it again the second time and it's $21, it's a dollar a day. It's, it's a beautiful practice every day because Again, it's about how you respond to the events that are happening in your life. And we know there's a lot of change out there and we need all the tools and all the spiritual practices and all the help that we can get so that we can make this world a better place. I'm so grateful, Dennis, that you said yes to, you know, bringing your theme on here with Comey and then also, uh, we were talking about it during the break that next time we'll, we'll probably talk about forgiveness or we'll talk about the Course in Miracles. Who knows what you're going to come up with, but I know that it's going to be fantastic because you have so much wisdom to share. You have so many um, skills that you've uh, developed and strengthened over the course of your life. And we're, we're just blessed to, to have you on. So look forward to it. Thank, thank you, Cornelia. I feel blessed to be on and to have this opportunity. And, uh, and I, you're a blessing as well to, uh, to basically be supporting so many people sharing their light. Um, it, it's a, there's, a, there's a very, there's a generosity and a kindness uh, and a love in that that uh, is really moving to me. I appreciate it. Oh, love you, Dennis. Thank you so much. Do you have any final words for our listeners today? Ah, oh, I don't admit, just, just, uh, I love to see you. I love to hear from you and, uh, and maybe we'll cross paths. Uh, it's a delight to share this work. It's, it's really had a huge impact on my life and, and I know it's touched a lot of others as well. Absolutely. It's touched me. It's already, it's, it's really, um, made me listen more and experience, you know, a greater level of nourishing. It's softening. And I yeah. love that. Yeah. So uh, everybody stay tuned for the Millionaire Imprint for Women. I'm with Michelle Boss. We're talking about right after this, we're talking about how to live in financial freedom. So thank you, Dennis. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. Namaste. Namaste. You've been listening to the Cornelia Stephanie show. Wake up to love your call to action. Tune in each week on Transformation Talk Radio. Cornelia's joy is to engage others in practical ways, showing us how to live in the new earth in harmony with our true nature. 
For more information on Cornelia and her extraordinary work, or to listen to past shows, go to her website at corneliastephanie.com.